Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multidimensional RPG podcast. Hello, listener. Greetings, fellow GM and or player. Welcome to episode 89 of Game Master's Journey, your multi-dimensional RPG podcast. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker, and I'm transmitting to you today from the Obsidian Monolith somewhere outside time and space. So welcome back to the show. It's it's great to be back. Uh, great to be back on the monolith and talk uh, some RPG stuff <laughs> with you. So I have a bit of a different topic today, kind of going to diverge from my usual course today and talk about how you should do what works for you at your table and not listen to me or any other loudmouthed person on the internet or on a podcast who tries to tell you differently. <laughs> So that's it. That's the episode, guys. Uh, Have a great week. I'll see you next week. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, I have more to say on the topic than that. I want to give a a shout out and a thank you to uh, Rob Whitaker, who sent me an email this week that that kind of spurred this this idea. Um, Like a lot of the show topics, this is something I've been kind of mulling over myself uh, lately. And Rob's email just kind of was the the final little push to actually talk about this on the show. So what am I talking about? Well, as you know, um, I've put out 89 episodes of this podcast, did, I don't know, 70 some episodes of GM Intrusions before that. And, you know, throughout this close to 200 episodes of RPG podcasting, I've given a lot of opinions and I've given a lot of advice, right? I've done a lot of, uh, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. This is what I think about this. This is what I think about that. And the problem with this being a solo show where, you know, a lot of times I'm on here by myself is if I'm not careful, sometimes it can come across like this is the way you should do it. This is the only way, right? Just because I don't have someone else here to disagree with me. (laughs) Right. So, so, you know, if I had another person on the show, you know, just by human nature, at least some of the times that I gave an opinion or statement, that person would have a difference of opinion. And and then we could talk about it, you know, which would convey to you that, hey, you know, not everybody agrees. Not everybody thinks the same thing. There isn't a quote unquote right answer. Right. But because a lot of times I'm on here by myself, uh, sometimes I'm afraid that it comes across like I'm telling you how to play your games, right? Which is not what I'm trying to do. I am trying to tell you what works for me and, and this is an ongoing process for me. Like I'm constantly learning as both a GM and a player. So to get to, to Rob's email, Rob basically emailed me and he was talking about the contrast he was seeing between my Obsidian Monolith adventure or campaign that I wrote for Numenera and ran, which you can see and hear some actual plays of that. I, I guess if you've listened to all the episodes of Game Master's Journey, you've heard uh, some of the actual plays. Um, so he saw some differences between that campaign and with my more recent Primordia adventures in D&D. Namely, to him, and and I agree with what he said, the Obsidian Monolith was very much, you know, I had an idea for a story, for a concept, you know, that I wanted to explore. And that was very fleshed out before I ever thought about anything mechanical or really game related. And then my Primordia adventure, I did pretty much the exact opposite where I didn't have really any idea for a story other than the player characters would be part of the Adventurers Guild and would hunt monsters. Other than that, I I didn't have anything. And instead what I did is I went through the monster manual and I picked out monsters that I thought would make cool encounters that I thought would be fun. And also that I was just curious how they, they would work 
in fifth edition because I very much wanted to kick the tires of fifth edition. I wanted to see how certain monsters compared to the same monster in 3.5 and the same monster in second edition and sometimes even in Pathfinder. Um, I wanted to see how the different tiers of play worked and, and things like that. So I kind of took the opposite approach where I came up with encounters first and then tried to, to find a way to connect them together in, into some form of a story. So Rob's question, he was wondering, you know, how much does the game itself or the mechanics of a particular game influence how I come up with a campaign or how I come up with adventures or stories or whatever? Like, like basically, is this difference that we see between my Obsidian Monolith campaign and my Primordia campaign, is that due to the fact that one was Numenera and one was D&D or not? And the short answer is it, it's really got nothing to do with the game system. Um, I, I know it, it's really tempting to look at that and say, oh, well, you know, Numenera is a more story focused game. And so that campaign was story focused and D&D is a more mechanics focused game. So that uh, campaign was more mechanics focused or more combat focused or whatever. But honestly, that that doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Numenera is just as uh, co combat focused as D&D is, uh, maybe even more so. Um, and if you don't believe me, I did a whole GM Intrusions episode on that, and you can go find that. That didn't have anything to do with it. Um, maybe the setting a little bit influenced, you know, what kind of campaign I ran. But honestly, I don't even think it was the setting, because you can have just as much mystery or strangeness in a D&D world as you can in the ninth world of Numenera. Um, <laughs> Really, the difference was me and what I wanted to do and also what I'd done recently. Because the, the, the problem, I think, or, or a misconception that, that you may arrive at from, you know, listening to the Obsidian Monolith and, and listening to me talk about my world building and everything else is you might come away with the impression that, well, this is the way I always do it. So the Obsidian Monolith is the way I always do a campaign, right? And uh, my episode I did where I was doing D&D &D encounters, that that's how I always do D&D &D encounters. And my actual play of Primordia, that's how I always, you know, run D&D. &D and, and the fact is, is none of that is true. Every campaign I do is different from the focus of the campaign. Everything from is it story focused or not? Is it plot driven or not? Is it improvised or not? Uh, do I use random encounters or not? How difficult? All these things vary from campaign to campaign. So it varies um, because, you know, I get bored easily. <laughs> and the last thing I want to do is finish a campaign and turn around and do another campaign that's the same. Right. So, you know, I could run five D&D campaigns in a row and they could all be very different. You know, you don't have to change games to do something different. You know, if you're playing D&D &D and it's starting to feel ho-hum and you're like, man, you know, I'm, I'm tired of doing the same old, same old. You don't have to go play Numenera <laughs> or Fate or something to get a different experience. You just need to change the way you approach the game. So I spend a lot of time in the RPG world. I listen to RPG podcasts. I play RPGs. I talk to people about RPGs. I read RPG blogs. I watch RPG YouTube videos. So I'm very immersed <laughs> in the RPG world uh, most of the time. And, you know, something that I see a lot of is, you know, people making podcasts, people writing blogs, whatever, are very much a lot of times like, this is how I do it and this is the way you should do it, right? And, and people make various assertions and you can find people making the opposite assertions, right? You know, so I thought it'd be fun to do an episode about how um, you don't have to listen to any of these people. <laughs> that um, for all these different things, there, there is no right or wrong way to do it, right? If you're having fun, if everybody at your table is having fun, then that's all that matters, right? It doesn't matter if you're doing it the way that someone else does it, even if that someone else is some podcaster you love or some YouTuber you love or some blogger you love. It, it, it doesn't matter. You know, that person, including me, is just telling you their opinion, right? We're, we're telling you what works for us and, and what we think 
And a lot of times we're, we're very passionate about our opinions. So it can come across like, you know, this is the only way. And, and we may even personally think that, but that doesn't make it true, right? And, and so I think it's important to at least occasionally kind of step back and acknowledge that there are other ways and that it doesn't really matter. What matters is what works for you, right? So I thought I would highlight a few things that I've talked about on the show and that are discussed a lot in the RPG world and just talk about how there's not a right or a wrong way to do it, okay? So the first one, the big one, that's been on my mind lately is and and kind of is somewhat related to Rob's email is whether your campaign or your adventure or your game should be story focused or not. And I think this is a big one because if you listen to podcasts, if you watch YouTube, if you pay any attention to anything RPG related on the internet or elsewhere, it's very easy to come away with the message that your game should be story focused. Everything should be about the story. And if it's not, you suck. Your game sucks. <laughs> and your players may be pretending to have fun, but they're really not having fun. Because if your game isn't story focused, then it's not worth playing. And that's total bullshit. Okay? Your game does not have to be story focused. Now, it just so happens that a lot of us who talk about gaming, whether on podcasts or YouTube or blogs, are kind of in the story camp. But if you think about it, I don't think that that means that most gamers out there are in the story camp. I think that it means that most gamers out there who are going to podcast, blog, or YouTube about gaming are in the story camp. <laughs> um, which... If you think about it and you know anything about, you know, writing and other uh, story creation uh, activities compared with being a YouTuber, a podcaster or a blogger, um, then it's obvious that there's a lot of crossover there. And, and it makes perfect sense that these people are the same people. Right. But it's very possible that this is a vocal, a very vocal minority that we're hearing from. Right. And, and that's the thing with the Internet is it's more about who's the loudest than, you know, who's got the most people on their side, you know, and it's very easy to get the impression that a certain opinion is what everyone thinks just because the few people that think that are really loud about it. And there could be many, many people that disagree with them, but just uh, can't be bothered to write about it or talk about it in a, in a public forum. So, you know, it's always something to, to keep in mind. So, you know, case in point, my, my recent uh, Primordia adventures were not story focused. Um, in fact, uh, I, I did have a story. Unfortunately, the players haven't yet uncovered that story. Um, they haven't really got enough pieces to really put together to have any idea of what's going on yet. But that's not the, the focus, right? The focus of those adventures was let's let's try out fifth edition. Let's see how it works. Let's have fun. Let's, uh, you know, do some world building. And, and you know, I wanted to try uh, opening up the player side of the table more to, to solicit more input from the players for world building type things. And let's just have fun with the game, right? Let's have a, let's have a beer and pretzels game. You know, let's just all have fun and, and not worry about being total thespians about it or, or you know, having to, to follow the three-act structure, structure or the hero's journey or any other construct and just have fun, right? And, and also to take the burden off my shoulders of, as a GM to try to be a novelist <laughs> uh, with my D&D &D game and, and worry about, you know, plot and all this stuff and instead just uh, present fun adventures, you know, maybe do a dungeon crawl, you know, and I'm personally, I'm a big fan of, of realism. Um, you know, I don't, I don't go so far as to say that the game I'm playing needs to be a simulation, right? Because no RPG really can be there, or at least not and be so complex. You can't really play it, but I do like verisimilitude. I do like realism and, and I like as much of it as I can manage without straining the game system I'm using too much or without bogging down 
you know, speed of play and things like that too much. So, you know, this whole like everything has to be story focused and everything has to tie into the story, especially like, you know, there are people that will say you shouldn't use random encounters and every encounter should tie into your story, should be relevant to your story. And there should be nothing that just randomly happens. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. I totally understand that point of view and where that person is coming from, but I don't agree with it because that's the opposite of verisimilitude. You know, your campaign is going to seem very contrived, maybe not right away, but eventually (laughs) will seem very contrived to the players if every single thing that happens directly correlates with the story or with their character, right? You know, the world goes on. The world doesn't care about us. The world doesn't care about our backgrounds or our histories or our personality flaws, right? It doesn't care. Things, shit happens, right? It happens because it happens. It doesn't have anything to do with us, you know? And I think I've said on the, the show before, although maybe your player should be the focus of the game, and maybe your players should be the focus of your world, and notice I'm saying maybe because, again, that's not black and white. That's not always true. That's not necessarily true for you, but some people believe that or feel that. So that may be true, but it shouldn't seem that way, right? Because the minute your game feels like or seems like it's all about the PCs and the world revolves around the PCs, well, it's not at all realistic, right? Oh, every, every goblin we encounter on the road is somehow going to tie into the main plot of this adventure. That's not realistic, right? Sometimes you just get jumped by bandits that have nothing to do with anything. They're just bandits that, that need some money so they can buy some food or, you know, buy a, a nicer house for their wife or whatever, right? Sometimes shit just happens. So, no, your game does not have to be story focused at all. That's, that's a decision for you to make, for your group to make, perhaps. So another big thing we hear about these days is cooperative storytelling, right? And it's very easy to think, well, this is the right way to do it. And if you're not doing cooperative storytelling, if you're not giving your players agency over things that are on the GM side of the table, like the world and the the setting and the NPCs and, and all that stuff, if you're not giving them agency over that, as well as their own characters, you're not doing it right. That's the old school way, that's wrong. That's not the way we do it anymore. Well, no. Cooperative storytelling can be a lot of fun and, you know, it may be the the right way for a given group of people, but it's not the only way and it's not the right way, period, for, for everybody, right? You know, some GMs just aren't comfortable giving their players that much control over their world, you know? I'm trying it with Primordia because Primordia is brand new and and, you know, I'm... A writer first and foremost so you know in my mind this is the first draft of primordia you know and the first draft of a novel looks nothing like the final draft of a novel right or a short story or anything right so i'm kind of okay with entertaining about any idea that a player comes up with because well why not we'll see how it works right this is first draft who cares right if i later decide that was stupid or I don't like it or it doesn't fit the flavor of my world, then I'll just shit can it, right? I'll just exit out and say, yeah, that isn't happening and never happened because I'm revising the world now, right? But if I was running in my homebrew world that I came up with 10 years ago and I've been building this world for 10 years and, you know, Unlike Primordia, a lot of things are, are defined and mapped out and, and, you know, kind of this is what is. Well, then I'm not going to be comfortable giving the players too much control over the setting and telling me what's on this block of the city or what's in this building because I already know, right? Or I already have a really good idea or the concept of my world is so well developed in my mind that a lot of the ideas the players come up with just don't fit, right? Like every world has a has a feel to it, right? So if you're playing in, let's say, Dragonlance, and you've got a player that's a huge Eberron fan, <laughs> and they're wanting lightning rails and, and 
Warforged and all this crap from Eberron and Dragonlance, you know, if Dragon, if that's your world, you're going to be like, no, <laughs> that doesn't fit. Okay. Your steampunk, magipunk stuff does not fit in my high fantasy world. Right. So no, <laughs> that's not there. That doesn't exist. You can't do that. Right. So again, it's all very situational, right? It, it depends where you are as a GM depends on, on your players. Um, but ultimately it depends on the GM, right? Because you're the one running the game. And, and, you know, this is something I see a lot today where, um, we're so worried about giving players agency and we're so worried about making the players happy that it's easy to forget that, um, the buck stops at the GM, you know what I mean? And, and it's not hard to find players unless you live in the middle of nowhere where people don't role play. But, but if you live somewhere where there are people that role play, it's not hard to find players. It can be difficult to find a GM, especially a good GM. So, and the GM is the one doing all the work, right? The players show up for a four hour session and that's it. And maybe if you have a really dedicated player, maybe he spends an hour working on character stuff, you know, in between sessions or something, right? But as a GM, you know, unless you're just totally pulling crap out of your ass and not preparing at all, you know, you're easily spending at least that much time, probably more outside of the game preparing, in addition to the four hours that everybody's dedicated to the game, right? So if you think about it, to give everybody at the table equal say in what happens, especially when it comes to the setting and the world and the NPCs and all that stuff, is really screwing over the GM. It's like, okay, so I do 10 times the amount of work as everybody else, but we all get equal say. So obviously that doesn't make sense, right? So, you know, if you're playing something like, I don't know, Dungeon World or 13th Age, where the setting is just like every campaign, you just make it up from nothing and there's no continuity in your world. You know, every campaign is a new world basically. And, you know, you want to do it where the players can declare things in your world and anything goes and that's, that's great. You know, but again, that's a very specific situation. And it's probably not a situation that many of us GMs are in because, you know, especially those of us playing D&D, you know, a lot of us have our own homebrew worlds, right? And you're not going to let just anybody come in and fuck with your, your world, right? I mean, not all ideas are good ideas. In fact, most ideas <laughs> aren't good ideas, right? So cooperative storytelling, depending on the game, depending on the setting, depending on the GM could be great or could be a horrible idea. It just depends. So another big one that, that we hear talked about a lot is improvisation, right? Improvisation versus preparation, right? And, and I think part of it is, you know, we, we have a lot of GMs these days who, you know, like me, started GMing maybe when we were in high school or maybe when we were in college. And now we're grown up, you know, we're married, we've got responsibilities, we've got jobs, maybe we got kids. You know, and it's hard to time find or it's hard. It's hard to time find. It's hard to find time to play much rather time to properly prepare. Right. And, and so this idea of improvisation can be very uh, attractive and appealing because it's like, oh, wow, you know, I can just show up to the game. I don't need to do any prep outside of the game or, or very little. Um, so all I need is to find time to to play the game every week and I'm good, you know? And if that works for you, that's great. But the problem is, is for every one person that's really good at improv, there's a hundred people that aren't, right? And those people that are really good at improv, part of the reason they're really good at improv is because they've, they've either had training and or they've had a lot of practice. You know, very few of us are born just good at that. You know, um, I love listening to uh, the one shot RPG with James D'Amato and, you know, definitely the hands down, the most entertaining actual play you can listen to. It's, it's great. But everybody at that table is a trained improvisational actor. You're probably not going to be able to have that experience at your table unless you and all your players are trained improvisational actors, you know, so you got to have realistic expectations, right? And for most of us, and I'd say probably even for the trained improvisational actors, I don't know, I'd have to talk to one to find out for sure. But for most of us, 
you know, when you're generating ideas and you can, you can pay attention to this, you can prove this for yourself next time you're brainstorming ideas for anything, whether it's character names or plots for your next adventure. Write down every idea you come up with. Look at that first idea and it's, it's probably terrible or it's something you've seen a hundred times before, right? Because usually when you're on the spot and you need to generate a creative idea, that first idea is copying something else. It's something you've seen before it, and it's probably something you've seen a hundred times before, right? So in the creative process, like as a writer, you know, the common wisdom is you never ever use your first idea. In fact, you don't use your second or even your third idea because all those ideas are derivative, they're unoriginal, they're cliches, they're not good ideas. You gotta keep digging. And eventually the good ideas come out after a lot of brainstorming, right? They don't, it's not the first few ideas you come up with. Well, when you're improving, that's that's all you're working with. <laughs> If you're if you're really good, maybe your brain is really fast or your players are really patient. You know, maybe you can sit there and think of three ideas and take the third one. But I think most of us when we're running a game and we're improving, we're just running with the first thing that pops in our head, right? And then you look back at your session and you're like, "Oh my god, like everything I came up with is so unoriginal." <laughs> well, originality takes time, right? Because you think about it, most of us that, that role play are probably you know, we're into whatever genre we role play in, whether it's science fiction or fantasy or whatever, beyond just playing an RPG, right? So if if you run D&D, you probably watch things like Game of Thrones or Shannara, you know, right? Or uh, the Lord of the Rings movies, right? It's, it'd probably be hard to find anyone who's been running Dungeons and Dragons for any length of time who probably hasn't seen all those things, right? You probably read fantasy novels, right? <laughs> so, you know, your head is filled with all these ideas that aren't your own. And, and a lot of those ideas are used in all of those things, right? And the other thing is, is your player's heads are filled with the same ideas. So not only is that idea not going to seem original to you, but it's not going to seem original to your players either, right? If you're playing space opera, You've probably seen Star Wars a million times, right? <laughs> so yeah, so so you get the point. So, you know, improvisation can be great for certain groups, can be great for certain games or certain sessions. I think improvisation is an excellent tool to have in your toolbox, no matter what your style as a GM, because, you know, you can prep all day, every day, and your players are gonna throw something at you that you didn't expect, and you're gonna have to improv, right? So it's a good skill for us all to develop, but it's not the end all be all. And it's not the only way to game and it's not the best way to game. There isn't a best way, that's the whole point. So next, plot directed adventures versus sandbox adventures. You know, you can find a lot of people online that are gonna tell you that plot directed adventures are railroads and they suck and a good GM doesn't do them and you should be running sandbox adventures. But you know what, if you, if you look a little harder, you can also find people that will tell you that sandbox adventures suck. They lack direction, they lack co cohesiveness, they lack a point, <laughs> they lack a story, and they don't work well with a lot of players, right? So, so which is right? Both, neither, right? It, it depends, it depends on you, it depends on your players. Personally, me as a player, I hate sandboxes. I, I really I really don't like them. I don't like playing in a sandbox uh, RPG adventure. Now, if we're talking a video game, eh, it depends. Sometimes they're okay, sometimes they're terrible. But as far as like tabletop RPGs, I don't like sandboxes. Um, I want there to be a story. I want there to be a point to what we're doing. I want there to be reveals. I want there to be mysteries to solve, you know, puzzles to figure out, things like that. You know, and, and you can't um, you can't have all that with just a, a complete utter sandbox. And I don't know, I like to know going into a session kind of what's in store, right? What, what are we doing this week? Like, I'd like to know. I don't want to spend an hour of every session trying to figure out what we're going to do. Right. Which is how, you know, a lot of sandbox games I've played in. That's kind of how it is. You spend more time trying to decide as a group what you're going to do than you spend actually doing anything 
And that's the one of the wonderful things about a plot driven adventure. It's like, yeah, you know, you got to get going right. The first few sessions might be kind of more like the sandbox where it's like, oh, what do we do now? You know, we got to have this long discussion about it. But once you get going, it's like everybody kind of knows, like you all have this goal that you're trying to get to. You might occasionally have different ideas of what's the next step, but you're all going to the same goal, you know, so it takes a lot less discussion <laughs> to decide what you're going to do as a group than when, you know, there's as many goals as there are players and opinions at the table, right? So plot directed sandbox, neither one is the right answer for everybody, right? And, and honestly, I think the best adventures personally are a blend. You know, per personally, I prefer an adventure that's plot directed that has a story to it that we can uncover as we play, but that has sandbox elements and which, which basically the sandbox elements is just having a GM that's willing to go with you and let you do whatever you want to do and not be like, Oh, sorry, the adventure doesn't cover that we we can't do that. Right. Which I'd, I've never had a GM that was that bad. <laughs> I I've had GMs where you could definitely tell when you're going off script and that they didn't like it and, and things got kind of awkward or boring, you know, until you got back on the script, you know, but I've never had a GM that was just like, no, you can't do that. Anytime you tried to do something that wasn't what they planned. Right. Um, so I would guess that 99% of games out there are at least somewhat sandbox right <laughs> it's hard to find a game that doesn't have any sandbox element but i'll bet you can find games without a plot directed element or at least at the beginning right because I, I think the thing is 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 we as humans we like stories we like telling stories and so even if you present your players with a complete sandbox game there's going to be a story that develops most likely right it's just you don't know what that is and it's up to the players to to figure that out um, and there's no real direction for them, um, which is what I don't like. I, I like direction. I like something to focus us as a group. But again, that's just my opinion. Another one I, I kind of touched on is the whole random encounters thing, right? There are a lot of people tell you random encounters are bad. Don't do them. <laughs> um, but that's not true. Um, even random, you know, I, I talked about random encounters in a recent episode, and I talked about how, you know, I don't really do random encounters I come up with them ahead of time and I use random encounter tables for ideas of what kind of encounters I could maybe do but I don't determine them randomly I don't determine them during play you know it's all done ahead of time but you could do like the total random like okay we're in the session I'm rolling to see if an encounter happens oh one happens I'm rolling on the chart up oh, here it is this is what we're doing that can be done well and it can be fine. It can be great. It can also be done very badly, but a planned encounter can be done very badly. So random encounters in and of themselves are not bad or good. It's uh, your skills, a GM at pulling them off and, and how you approach them. And it's also your players. You know, there are players that hate random encounter. And, and you know, if you have these players at your table, even if you're doing random encounters, you got to put up the smoke and mirrors to make it seem like it's not a random encounter because some players will just be turned off just because they think it's a random encounter, right? There are other players that love them, you know, especially a lot of the grognards, right? You know, we remember back in the day, first edition days, you know, wilderness survival guide, you know, and uh, random encounters and all that good stuff. And, you know, some people love that. And not just grognards either, right? Some newer players like that stuff. It's like, yeah, let's see what happens. Let's see what the dice say, right? So, you know, we as gamers, we are a very diverse community just in our ideas and in our likes and our dislikes. So, you know, anytime anybody tries to tell you that anything is good or bad just across the board, you know, you got to kind of wonder if they're full of it because it's hard to think of any absolutes when there's such a diversity in where people are coming from and what people want out of the hobby, you know, cause that's another thing is a lot of these, you know, advice that, that we all give about, Oh, you know, you shouldn't do plot driven games or, or you shouldn't do sandbox or whatever. This advice is always assuming that everybody is wanting the same things from the game that, that I want. 
right? Which isn't true. Like I remember when I was in college and I was playing a lot of White Wolf, I was very much like what, what my friends, we used to call a thespian <laughs> role player, which is actually hilarious because I have zero acting talent. But, but just the idea of, you know, this is more than a game. Like we really want to get into our characters. We want to play these roles. We want to be these characters. And our goal is, you know, my goal when I was running those games was literally you walk in the door, you're in character until you walk out of the door, right? Even when we're on break and we're ordering pizza or whatever, we're still in character. And it worked because we were playing White Wolf, so it was modern day. So, of course, if we were playing Vampire, Vampires didn't eat pizza. But Changelings ate a lot of pizza, man. Those Changelings, they love their pizza. So, you know, you're eating pizza in character, right? And, and I would get annoyed if someone would break character for whatever reason, right? But everybody was kind of like, everybody wanted to do that, right? And, and part of it was probably because I really wanted to do that. I was the game master. So I found players that wanted what I wanted, you know, so we're all on the same page. And, and that's a big part of it. I, I guess if there is a black and white, you know, this is the way you should do it. I would say if you're a GM, you should find players that are looking for the same things that you are. They want to play the same game. They want to have the same type of outlook. You know, can we break character? You know, do we allow metagame discussions? You know, all that kind of stuff. Are we going to use miniatures or not? You know, how, how story focused or not is this game going to be? You know, is this a beer and pretzels game or what? Right? Like that's the, that is the one black and white thing I can think of is if you want to have a good time as a GM, find people that is closely aligned in all those ways with what you want as you, and then you'll all have a good time. If you're, you know, you got a table full of, of people that, that are really story focused and they want a lot of RP and all this stuff. And then you got one guy, guy at the table that's your min max or power gamer, and he just wants a lot of combat so he can use his totally broken character and, and show everyone up there's going to be a disconnect, right? You're either going to have players that aren't super happy or maybe the GM's not super happy because you're having all this metagaming and, you know, number crunching and comparing builds and all this crap at the table that you don't want. Or you're going to have a, a player who's unhappy because it's all RP and social stuff. And, you know, all this time he spent making this power game character was kind of wasted because it doesn't matter because it's rare that there's combat. And a lot of times those combats are solved through role playing means <laughs> and not by, oh, look how much damage I can do. Right. So, again, it's not that either one of those approaches are wrong. It's just that it's a bad fit between those players. Right. So another thing that, that people will discuss is difficulty. How hard should the game be? Right. And, and this is another topic I touched on a while ago when I talked about, you know, should the players always win? And I said, no. Right. But again, that's assuming that you're looking for the same things from an RPG experience that I am. Right. But maybe you're not. If you're looking for a beer and pretzels game, and you just want everybody to have fun and you want, you know, over the top heroic fantasy where the, the characters are badass and they can't be defeated, then maybe you do want the players always to win. And maybe if there's a puzzle, the answer is just whatever they come up with. And there wasn't an answer ahead of time, right? Because nobody cares about solving a puzzle. Nobody cares about being challenged mentally or emotionally. People just want to get together with their friends, have some fun, roll some dice and have a good time. And that's all they want. And, you know, that's another thing, you know, as far as like, you know, true advice that you could take to the bank, you know, again, the whole everybody being on the same page, right? And as a GM, recognizing where your players are at. And if you have a bunch of players that want a beer and pretzel game, then you don't need to really agonize over puzzles or mysteries or um, these intricate story plots right? Because the players don't care. Just give them what they want. It'll be a lot easier for you. <laughs> right? Of course, of course, my best advice would be, well, find players that want the same thing you do. If, if it's important to you, maybe you don't care, right? Because some GMs don't care either. Some GMs are like, you know what? I just want to get together with my friends and have fun. And if they want a beer and pretzels game, fine. I don't care. If they want a very intrigue laden, you know, story focused role playing experience, 
that's fine too. I can do that too. I just want everybody to have fun, you know? So it's not just players that, that can come to the table with that kind of attitude that GM can too, which is kind of nice because then it's easier to find consensus if people are more kind of open to different things, right? So yeah, difficulty. Some people don't want to be challenged or, or don't want there to be a real risk of failure. You know, some people don't want to take the time to make a character and then have them die in the first session. You know, I'm one of those people. Like, I hate these funnel games. <laughs> you know, like like the whole concept of make 10 characters and maybe if you're lucky, one will live to see second or even first level. It's like, fuck that. I got better things to do. You know, if, if I want to, like, just watch characters die, I can go, like, play a first-person shooter for the first time <laughs> and watch my character die over and over until I figured the game out, right? I'm just not into that. Now, some people, I mean, obviously people must like it because these games exist and people buy them, right? But I would, you know, I would never, I mean, I would try one. I haven't actually tried one of these games. So I would try it. I would give it the college try just so I can say, yes, I have played a game like that. And yes, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't see like I would do a one shot right I'm not going to sign up for a campaign like that because I know I'm not going to like it it's like you know I like to put some thought into my characters and, and basically that kind of game tells you don't put any thought into your character I need you to crank out 10 first level or zero level characters in like 30 minutes and don't don't think about them don't get attached to them because they're going to die anyway right so there's zero character development most likely um, before the game actually starts. And there's zero character development until the players get to a point where they think there's actually a chance their character might survive. And at that point, you've been playing your character how many weeks? So you're kind of in a rut now, you know? So if you haven't developed your character up to this point, do you really think you're going to from now on? Maybe. I don't know. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not into that, you know? So, so if I was considering joining a game and I found out it was a funnel game, or the DM was like, you know, there's very real chance you won't live past first level. So have ideas for another character. I'd probably be like, yeah, I think I'll pass on this. So, you know, there there are people that like me that do not want to play in a game where chances are good that, that you won't even live through a session because we want to develop a character over time, right? And, and we want to play a character that's more than just numbers on a piece of paper. In session one is a developed character character already right you know I'm, i think of those players who will give you like a three page backstory right that player is not going to be happy if their character dies in the first session right because unless they just don't care and they they just crank out three page backstories all the time which i've known players like that like they really wouldn't care um but a lot of players would care and would not be happy right so on the there's people on the other side of the spectrum who are, you know, you, you get into that area of there's no risk. There's no realism, again, in the game. If there's no real chance that my character is ever going to die, then what's the point, right? I, I also agree with that. So I'm in on this spectrum, I'm somewhere in the middle because I don't want, like, you know, a funnel game. But at the other side of the spectrum, I don't want a game where my character can't die because that's not fun either. I, I want... I want there to be a real chance of failure or success, and I want the thing that tips that scale one way or the other to be my decisions I make during play and how good are they. If I make good decisions, chances are good I'll succeed. If I make bad decisions, chances are good I'll fail. You know, kind of like life. Like, that's what I want, personally. But there are people on extreme ends of the, the spectrum and everywhere in between. So again, you know, the real trick is kind of... I think as a GM is knowing what you want. Don't even worry about what your players want. The first step is worrying about what you want and getting that, getting solid on what do I want as a GM? What kind of players do I want? What kind of game do I want? What kind of experience do I want? What kind of story do I want? Figure all that out and then go find players that fit that. Right. And figure out these players where where are they coming from? Where do they want? What do they want? And does that fit with what I want? And if not, keep looking, you know, and earlier I said, oh, well, maybe if you live in the middle of nowhere, you don't have 
you know, choices, but that's really not true because you can play online now. I've been playing almost exclusively online for over a year now. And yes, it. I will be the first to tell you that any online gaming experience as far as tabletop RPGs is inferior to an in-person around the table experience. It, it just is. You don't get to roll actual dice. Um, it's a lot harder to read people and body language and and you don't get so much that communal like we're doing this thing together there's very little chance of you all catching a movie together or going out to eat together or doing other things together as a group it's much less likely that you're going to be actual friends with these people beyond the game and you know people will just pull shit online that they would never do in person you know, you'll have people like a player that's played in your game for a long time, just not show up one day and you never hear from them again. Like in real life, that person probably wouldn't do that. They would at least tell you, hey, man, I, I'm not going to play anymore. Right. They wouldn't just not show up. Right. But online, it's like yeah, people do that all the time because it's like, ah, I don't care. I don't know these people. They don't know me. I'll never see them again. Who cares? And it's just not um, you don't get a roll physical dice. The voice comms aren't great. You know, to where, you know, if you're in a room full of people and two people are talking at the same time, it's really annoying and obnoxious, but you can a lot of times kind of get what each person is saying, right? Online, no, because it will cut someone out. Whoever is the loudest person is who the software decides you get to hear and the other person will just be completely cut out. You'll see their lips moving, but nothing's coming out. So you don't know what that person's saying. So, you know, I definitely feel that the online is inferior to in-person playing but it's better than nothing you know and if you're living somewhere like where i grew up in small town indiana where it's really hard to find people to role play and maybe it's like you can barely find enough people to fill a group and then that's it like you don't really have any choices between players it's like well there's five people in this area that role play so i'm kind of stuck with those five people right you might feel like, well, I'm stuck with these five people, but you're not, you can play online. And I, I would say playing online with a good group of players that gel well with you will be more enjoyable than playing in person with a group of players that don't gel well with you. So, you know, if you haven't tried it, give it a try. Um, there is a bit of a learning curve, although Roll20 is pretty easy. You know, you, you wanna pay out the nose for Fantasy Ground, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Can't help you there. But uh, Roll20, I I mean, to do the very basic with it is not hard to learn. So, yeah, you know, I, I saw some, some articles recently about the Tomb of Horrors adventure from old D&D days. You know, and, and some people think it's the best D&D adventure of all time. In fact, I was uh, looking uh, this last summer. I read various articles on, you know, what are the 10 best adventures for D&D that have ever been published in any edition? And almost every article I found or blog post or whatever I found on that topic said that Tomb of Horrors was the best, or it was at least in the top five of pretty much all of them. And what I was thinking is I was like, you know, I, I played a little bit of first edition. I really came into it in the second edition days. Didn't play any of the original D&D. And I mean, I wouldn't want to. <laughs> I wouldn't want to play first or second edition either. But, you know, I hear people talk about these adventures from those days. And, you know, it's really easy to convert stuff to fifth edition. So I was like, well, let me find the best of the best and, and maybe run those in fifth edition. And I actually had the idea originally of maybe doing uh, something online where every few weeks I would run one of these old adventures and put it on YouTube and stuff. I thought it would be really fun. So, so that's why I was looking for, you know, what are the best D and D adventures of all times? And so I got a hold of Tomb of Horrors, got a hold of a copy of it. Cause I'm like, oh wow, everybody says this is the best D and D adventure ever written. Can't wait to run this for my group. I started reading it and I was like, what a steaming pile of shit this is. I would never run this adventure. This adventure is terrible. In fact, if I were to do an episode on how not to be a GM and how to totally fuck up as being a GM, I would use that adventure as like a talking point <laughs> to guide the discussion. I'd be like, here's an example of how not to do an adventure and how not to run a game. And if you want to fail utterly as a GM, I recommend Tomb of Horrors. I think it'll work great for you. Uh, 
So it actually killed the whole idea. I also, I looked at some of the other, you know, highly ranked adventures like White Plume Mountain, and I thought they were all pretty bad. Um, some of them, like White Plume Mountain, I think is salvageable. I think you could get a fun adventure out of that if you, you know, gut the thing and and just use what works and, and scrap the rest. But they were really bad, really bad. Um, <laughs> like, you know, you want to talk about story. Tomb of Horrors, there's no story. I mean, there's a little bit of a backstory, but it's not really relevant. There are people that love Tomb of Horrors, so, right? So we can't even agree on, you know, something that so many people say is the best adventure of all time. Just as many people will say that adventure is terrible, like me, right? So there's been been some discussion about this adventure lately. And, and basically, um, there I read a blog post by someone, um, different reasons of what I would say, but, but that agreed with me that it was a, a terrible adventure and uh, probably wouldn't end well for you. I, you know, it, that adventure very much depends on what you and your players are looking for. for with the right group of people uh, that are looking for what that adventure provides, they might have some fun with it, especially if you're into funnel stuff that will be right up your alley. Um, it's kind of like high level funnel, 10th level funnel, <laughs> basically. Um, but for me, never, I, I would never want to run it. I would never want to play it or anything like it. But but that is on the extreme end of the difficulty scale. Um, that's unfairly difficult. You know, like I would normally not throw a challenge at a group of players that A, will kill them if they get it wrong, and B, there's no way for them to know how to get it right. It's just a, a flip of a coin, a roll of, you know, there's no, there's nothing to figure out. It's like there's three doors. Pick one. Two of them are gonna kill you. One of them you might live. And there's, there's no riddle. There's, there's no way for your character to know or for the player to figure out which door is right. It's just that you've got a one in three chance of picking the right thing. Have fun with that. Oh, and if you pick the wrong thing, campaign's over. <laughs> we get to roll new characters, right? Um, I would never do that, right? So the, the, the hardest, you know, my scale of difficulty would go as a GM is here's a problem in front of you. It's almost impossible to figure out, but not impossible, right? Almost impossible. But there is a chance that you could figure it out, right? And I've honestly, I've never done that because um, I've just read too many articles about puzzles and mysteries and whatnot and how... Um, difficult it is to pull them off. It, it's very difficult to make a puzzle that is not either too easy or too hard, right? Um, it, it's really, it's almost impossible, you know? And, and even in published adventures, puzzles usually fail um, hilariously because they're either way too easy and it's stupid. And it's like, why is this even here? Or the players can't figure it out, right? And the GM just has to like give them the answer or give them a hint that's as well as giving them the answer and which point like what's the point of the puzzle anyway right if it's so easy it's a no-brainer there's no point and if it's so hard the gm has to give it to you there's no like why did we even do this this was a waste of time right but again the difficulty is not something there's not a right or wrong answer it depends you know some people want something really easy some people want something really hard a lot of people want something in between and it also varies, you know, and that's another thing is, you know, a lot of these people <laughs> you're talking about all this stuff also are assuming first they're assuming that the same answer is going to work for everybody. And second, they're assuming that the same answer is going to work for everybody all the time. Right. Which, which is not the case. You know, every I don't want every gaming experience I have at either end of the table to be the same or similar. Right. I don't want every game I play to be crazy easy or crazy hard. I, I want some variety, right? And even within a campaign, right? You know, um, a lot of uh, the advice in the new DMG for designing adventures and campaigns kind of boils down to don't always do the same thing, right? Within an adventure, within a campaign, you want to have different things going on, you know? You don't want it to all be combat. You don't want it to all be social interaction, right? You, you want a variety. You don't want all the encounters to be hard. You don't want them all to be easy. You don't want them all to be deadly. You want a variety, right? Because anything that you do all the time is going to get boring. So you want to change it up. And, and that way, 
You can be unpredictable. We GMs, we like to be unpredictable, right? We don't like the players to know what we're going to do ahead of time. That's no fun for anybody. So yeah, so there's there's some things. Uh, I'm sure there's others. So I would love to hear from you um, if you can think of things that, that you know people get on their soapboxes about and say this is the right or the wrong way to role play. Um, that I miss that are big ones because I'm, I'm sure there are some I'd love to, to hear them maybe I'll, I'll revisit this or I'll, I'll mention it in a later episode uh, so yeah you know if, if you've seen or heard people saying you know this is the way you should do it and it's not a black or white like yeah that's the way everybody should do it if it's more situational or dependent on the people involved uh, let me know so I guess you know my closing thought on this is just you know, beware, <laughs> be a critical thinker, right? Don't take anybody's opinion to the bank. And you got to be careful. People on the internet love presenting opinions as facts. So just ask yourself, is this a fact? Is this something that, that can be proven or disproven with evidence and, and we have the evidence to do so? Or is this someone's opinion and they're trying to make it sound like it's a fact? when it's really just their opinion. And if it's their opinion, you know, facts are facts, right? You, I mean, I guess you can disagree with facts, but it's a pretty stupid thing to do. Facts are facts, right? They are. <laughs> There's no arguing with them. Opinions are opinions and everybody has one. They're pretty worthless. So if it's an opinion, ask yourself, do I agree? Because it's an opinion. You don't have to agree with it. And, you know, I've probably learned as much, maybe even more from reading and hearing opinions from people that I disagree with than ones that I agree with. Because, you know, at least for me, like if we're talking about game mastering and someone write, reads an article and I read it and I'm like, I agree with everything they say, I didn't really learn anything there. They're just reinforcing what I already think, right? Like I didn't get anything from that other than, oh yeah, I'm awesome because this guy thinks the same way I do, right? But if I read an article where I'm disagreeing with a lot of things, that's where I tend to learn stuff because that starts this internal dialogue of, wow, this really bothers me what this thing person said. Why is that? Why does that bother me so, so much? Why do I disagree so much with that? And going through that kind of process kind of helps me better understand my opinion because I've reanalyzed it now that I've been faced with with a very different opinion that, that I really didn't like. So figuring out why I really dislike this other opinion helps me understand why I like my opinion. And sometimes I may change my mind or, or maybe not completely change it, but revise it, right? So yeah, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. Nobody's an expert nobody's the master of how to play or how to GM and, and has all the answers because there aren't, you know, there aren't answers that work for everybody. Everybody's different. Everybody wants different things at different times. You know, there are times that I, whether GM or player, there are times that I want to have this really immersive story experience with lots of role playing and, you know, really develop characters and all that stuff. And then there's times I just want to drink a beer and kill some monsters right and you can do both you don't have to like be locked in the one way of thinking or one way of doing things even with the same group even with the same campaign you know you could have one game session that's very serious and very you know story focused and all that stuff and then the next session could just be a, a total farce and everybody's just having a good time and then the next week you could do something else you know, so so even if you're in the middle of, of a campaign that's been going for years and shows no signs of stopping, you know, don't don't let yourself feel like you're stuck in this rut and you can't do anything else. And in fact, if you're in a campaign that's been going that long, doing something totally different would probably be a godsend to your campaign and would probably kind of wake everybody up and, and get everybody interested again. Because, you know, anything that goes on for a long period of time, we just we just start to lose interest, right? You know, it just starts to become old hat after a while. So, you know, change things up. Surprise your players with something new and different and totally out there. Why not? Could work.
So that's going to wrap up episode 89 of Game Master's Journey. I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Are there some black and white answers out there that uh, that I missed or glossed over? Or or I don't think it's black and white, but you do? Let me know. Are, are there some other uh, soapboxes that, that GMs get on trying to tell other GMs to do it the way they do it that, that you disagree with and you don't think it's that black and white and, and you don't think that works for everybody? Let me know. I, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at Lex Starwalker. You can follow me on Google+, Plus, plus Lex Starwalker. Uh, check out my website, starwalkerstudios.com. You can find the show notes there. You can find all the episodes there. You can find all the podcasts I do there. Uh, right now, the other podcast I'm producing is Expanse, the unofficial podcast about the new TV show, The Expanse. I do that with my wife, Nikki. And we have a lot of fun with that. And uh, we've had a couple really awesome interviews on there uh, with people who actually work on The Expanse, members of the crew. Um, so if you're interested in like visual effects or cinematography, um, maybe check those episodes out. Um, very interesting stuff. I, I just, I love movie making. It's so interesting. Um, and if you haven't seen The Expanse, oh my God, you gotta go see it. It's the best thing on TV right now. I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Mr. Steve Strickland, my tier five patron. Woo! Yeah, Steve! Woo! You the yes. man. So thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to all the patrons for your support. I really appreciate it. I also want to thank uh, everybody who donates on the website. I've, I've received a few donations in the last couple weeks. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoy Game Master's Journey and you'd like to see this show continue and, and keep going for, for another year, definitely support the show. Head to the show notes. Go to the bottom. There are a lot of ways you can support the show. They don't all cost you money. Some of them are super easy to do. And I uh, really appreciate it. You know, um, show's kind of only as good as, as you guys uh, help it to be, ultimately. So I really appreciate everybody that, that gives back a little bit. Um, to Star Walker Studios and Game Master's Journey and and helps me keep going. I really appreciate it. I hope that you have a chance to play your favorite RPG this week. I'll be back soon with another episode of Game Master's Journey. Until then, game on. This has been a Star Walker Studios production. Your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music provided by Cloudwalker, Renfield, Transboy, and Ish. Please see the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey.